Okay, so I wanted to actually read a different book called In Cold Blood, but maybe you guys have even read it before. But I used to have that book on hand, and now I don't, so it was kind of difficult to find it, to find a good chapter for it. So I, I just looked up recommendations for once, just to find an English book that would be a good recommendation for it. But I hope you're having a good October or a good spooky day or time. And I'm recording this on my phone for once, so maybe the quality might be a little bit different. In any case, um, I found this book and I'll just read one chapter and it seems to be a bunch of short stories. So I just picked a random chapter. It seems to be maybe a different story. So let's read it. And uh, get in the atmosphere, light a candle, eat some pumpkin pie or something. I don't know what do people do for Halloween. The chapter is called No Darkness But Ours. We will pull down the mountains and devour the stars. And there will be no darkness but ours. Ooh, I love a poem in the beginning of a anything. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Why did I do this to myself? Um, Rhoda Jean. So go look. That's a name, by the way. Uh, walks. Rhoda Jean. Oh, my God. Walks with steady steps up the dark highway. Highway. Toward a blurred mass of thoughts, the signs on her path named Toronto. It's 3.35 on a Thursday morning, late November, although since RJ's watch broke 80 miles back, she wouldn't know. Mickey Mouse's tiny hands hung loose beneath cracked glass, describing spastic arcs with the jolt of each new stride. The night presses down on her with palpable weights, Unbroken by headlights, unscarred by neon. A fine mist rises to cover her tracks. Somewhere above, a 747 screams. Look at her now. 13 years old, 5 feet 7 inches. She, wore, she wears a baggy gray sweater over brown and yellow plaid kilt, whose helm barely brushes her knees. Across her flat chest, a paw, a pale mauve, in pale mauve letters, the legend, Sacred Heart of Jesus Bleeds for You, may be dimly made out. Her arms swing limp at her sides, slender fingers bent for Piano's keys or guitar strings now tipped by splintered nails and caked with mud. She walks quickly, her eyes never leaving the unseen horizon. It's cold, but RJ doesn't mind. Her bare feet leave small bloody prints in the gravel by the side of the road. RJ's thin, thin mouth shapes a faint triangular smile. No need to hurry. What she's coming for has waited this long. A few more hours changes nothing. And the air around her takes a quality suggestive of storm clouds massing to the north. Black and heavy with snow. Passing her, uncalled images spring to mind, reflections of a cold life in a distant land. Birds hanging frozen from telephone wires, milkweed caught by frost in mid-launch. Yeah, I just cracked, I'm sorry. <laughs> shallow, bed, shallow bed rock graves. Take me down, baby. Take me where I want to go. 
Take me down, down, down. Baby, take me where I want to go. Forget it, booger. It's mine anyway. That is, it was my turn. You don't play fair, says who? Besides, you'll just break it. Take me down, baby, now. Baby, take me down. Will not. Will so, booger. Won't. And don't you call me booger. Why not? Broke it quick enough last time, snot nose. Don't call me snot nose, you rat turd. All the way down, down, down. Baby, take me where I want to go. Snot nose, snot nose, booger, booger, booger. Harold Monk, 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 Harold Monk, son, Jr. Call him Hank, braces himself for a screech from the back seat. He isn't disappointed. Daddy, Daddy, Jeannie called me a booger and she wasn't too far off, you little shit. Ronald, if I hear one more peep out of either of you about the goddamn Transformer, it's straight back to Buffalo and I'm not kidding. Vicious whispers greet this announcement. Under the parental guidebook, they qualify as silence. Hank inhales and coughs, bitting marble smoke. The car reeks of three parts in first parks proximity and one part greasy Chinese food. His vision started blurring at the border and that throbbing just behind his left eye is surely an in- incipient migraine. He couldn't find one station on the entire radio that isn't playing fucking disco. Take me down, baby, now. Take me where I want to go. All the way down, down, down. Take me where I want to go. I guess this is a song by that. Christ, yes. Hank pleads in words. Take her. to wait on my account. Hank's a real estate agent. He lives in Toronto. His ex-wife, as of gaining custody in Buffalo, so far this simple strategy has kept his fits down to a minimum. But last Sunday, fortified by five beers and the promise of three weeks vacation time, Hank drove down its advantages probably fatherly privileges. A decision he has come to regret heavily. In fact, further discussion on the Transformer notwithstanding, he's beginning to seriously consider just turning the car around and driving straight back up the white line until he hits a truck. What? The disco singer croons on, her backup vocalist lapsing into a seemingly endless series of deep, orgasmic grunts. Behind him, Jeannie and Ronald have struck up a blessed truce. Transformer discarded in favor of comics and Green Day glow slime. Before him, the road falls away without a moment's pause and smooth as a lidded eye. Around him, silence. But Hank feels a sudden prickling of sweat. He grips the wheel cold. His palms are wet. He couldn't tell you why if he tried. A quarter moon sweats over Bury. Seven miles gone, police have just entered the last gas station. Hank drove by while Jeannie and Ronald set up a steady whine, imploring him for ice cream. Phone calls and trips to the little boy's room. Officer Sam Wu throws the adjacent diner's kitchen door wide. Gun up. The owner lies slumped in one corner, holding a shotgun and wearing a big grin. Nearby, his wife Marie sprawls face down in a tepid pool of rotisserie grease, a stencil of goofy staring from a discarded apron. In the TV lounge of Toronto's Gourmand Manor, a halfway home for 
newly released mental patient. A lanky man with gray hair works on a picture of Princess Leia in his Star Wars coloring book. Being very careful to stay within the lines, he gives her red eyes and navy blue skin. His name is Meron Sokolu, and he is RJ's father. Father. 40 miles away and closing. RJ runs her tongue across her teeth. There are no stars left visible to watch. Jeannie Monkson shifts irritably. She has a whopping crick in her neck. Same, girl. Same. Glancing over her shoulder, she sees her brother, Booger, a.k.a. Ronald Jerome Monkson, gearing up for yet another whine about how he's so cold or he really needs to pee or he can't we stop for a burger like nobody else in the whole wide world was ever chilly or hungry or waiting for a try the next John. Available John. How'd you like a mixed fruit cocktail instead, Bug? Jeannie thinks, taking mental sight of the back of his head. Kapow, pow, 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 pow. Nothing happens. She turns away, sighing disgustedly. Fact is, there's shit all over. There's shit to do on the trips with dad, except pick on Booger, no pen. I guess they're saying nothing to do. No pun intended and dream about Christopher Walks walking. An utter hunk. Turns my crank. God, how old are you? And the day dogs of war. What a bitching flick. Good plot. Great locations and a bu a bu coop de good looking babes dripping with sweat up to their necks and muds. What else could you possibly ask for? Real life pales by comparison. Especially when the most immediate slice of that life involves being trapped in a rented hondo that stinks of stale cigarettes and egg rolls out in the middle of fucking nowhere with a man she hasn't seen or missed seeing for the last five years and a little brother she sees constantly every single day of her miserable existence. Jeannie stretches idly at her cheek, testing the latest spot where she knows a pimple will sprout before morning. Suddenly, she draws the next three weeks like a map. The stream of lackluster events and petty annoyances oozing inevitably toward her their last big blow. A ticket home and a stiff goodbye at the station with no parting gifts. With Booger weeping and drooling all over the seat next to the window, with even the faintest possibility of a bus accident just straddling them in some roadside dive until mom's newest flame can drive them back home, where they'll be grounded for three more weeks for causing her the trouble. Jeez. Booger stares intently at his left shoes, freckles swollen, big as mumps, in the dashboard slide. In the real view mirror, Hank's eyes seem to be seen the same red shot shade of gray as multiple baloney. Bol, 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 oh my god, why can't I speak? Who are these people, Jeannie thinks? I don't know them, and I don't care. And she sees a halo of bullets peel their face back to free the blood inside. Their brains painting the wilderness. Her eyes tighten on an imaginary trigger. Yes, any time. For a split second, she'll, she's all alone in someone else's skull. Cursed silent by the view. Walking into the night. Every pore gorging on its darkness. Just breathing in and out. In and out, in and out. Under the corn fleas which bracket the highway, animals stir restlessly in their long sleep, hearing the beat of a measured tread, 
tread which chills their cold blood even further. A raccoon t- curls tight, cracking open the end of a rapid bone as his teeth grind together. A sharp white splinter pierces his gum. Mice pull their tiny paws over their ears and bear her deeper. A knot of garter snakes strangle itself. A anthill's entire winter supply of egg withers as the sole of RJ's left foot blocks out the sky. Suddenly, she pauses mid-stride. She sniffs the air. A car is coming. Never in his dream is he bugger. They call him by much sweeter names in the world behind his eyes, which he visits as often as the bark and babble of more mundane reality will ever let him. The candy color world where no one ever yells, whose inhabitants comprise of the entire toy section of his mother's consumer catalog, like Chuck E. Cheese, but better, where his, it's his birthday every day, where he's absolute ruler, where Jenny and Hank lie, screaming, stretch taunts on the rack of his fertile imagination. In Booker's world, he is King Ronald, the first and only and they call him Master. Ah, Booker's thoughts graze RJ clumsily. They see, full of bile she drinks like wine. Only a sip though, he's young. She turns her attention to the others, Hank and Jenny. Scratch them, they bleed as deeply, if all unknowingly. Very close and getting closer. Yes. And the hunger grips her keen as love. Somewhere someone whispers, feed and be strong, my love. Strong enough to kill them or anyone else. Strong enough to eat the world. Time enough for that, Lil, later. With one foot on either side of the the white line, RJ turns and pauses. Folding her arms, she readies herself. She holds up a fallow mirror to the shallow minds rushing toward her, painting her with their petty hopes and dreams. She holds it high and her reflection grows a more accurate one than any of them can stand to look at for long. When they come, they will find her waiting. Are we there yet? For a moment, Hank stares. Jeannie meets his eyes, her own full of contempt level enough to goad him beyond surprise. He snaps. What do you think? Jeannie leans forward. A smile tugs at her lips. Almost. But not quite a smirk. I think you're lost. Dad. Click. Stepped in it there, didn't you? Someone says, conversationally. Trap works both ways, Hanko. That's why they come with instructions. Shut up! He hisses. Jeannie recoils. Booger is wide awake now, watching the two of them in rapid fascination. The green slime drips forgotten down the side of his leg. Almost as good as TV, Hank thinks. Then, it's starting. What's starting? Christ, I'm getting hysterical. Jeannie's smile has hardened near enough to Grim to call the cousin. Stop the car! Don't be stupid, Hank says automatically, quietly. So now I'm stupid? Click. All right. All right. Yeah, Hank begins. The words are cut thin 
too fast to catch and too wounded to blood. Yeah, that's right. You're a stupid little girl who has too much makeup and listens too, mu to, too much crap on that stupid Walkman and thinks the world owes her something, which it doesn't, any more than I do. Pause. And what do you think of that? <laughs> Jeannie's eyes hold tanks. Beneath them, something familiar stirs. Something akin to the sticky stew of rage currently a boil behind his own. I think you can go fuck yourself, she says. Booker screeches, clapping his hands next to Hank's ears with the subtle, a subtlety of a mortal shell explosion. Genie said the F word, he sings happily. Fuck you too, Booger. Genie shoots back. Booger drums his heels on the back of Hank's seat, transported. Genie said the F word again, he howls. The road swims before Hank's eyes. Shut up, bugger, he hears himself say. Daddy! Jeannie knocks Boogers aside and leans for him. Give me the keys. Hank glances at the road. He finds it whipping by so fast it's starting to blur. We weren't going this. The odometer spitting the miles. And Hank realizes the ache he feels in his leg comes from the fact he's been pressing steadily down on the accelerator ever since this conversation began. Jeannie, he starts. She squeezes five sharp pink and blue varnished points, stretching his jacket thin enough to rip. Give me the fuck I will. Booker is in seventh heaven. You said the F for daddy, he screams, slinging his pupabescent weight a Against Hank's other shoulder, he cries out in pain. It's at this exact moment they see RJ. At first, a smear of black at the horizon. Darkness on darkness. And a stick figure draped in gray. The gray deepens. Cross hatches. She is an old woman now. Whom ha hair hangs like frosted lead. Her shoulders scrape the sky. They are twenty feet away. Nineteen. With every foot, she's even more inevitable. Her hand smooths from faint strap stippling to moon pale. And equally disinterested features. She raises her head to greet them. Brushing her bangs aside. She smiles, and their headlight catches her glasses. God, no. Abruptly, the world is in two white circles, white on white. The dark is gone, and nothing takes its place. Hank, Jeannie, and Booker freeze, caught in their glare. They see themselves reflected in her eyes. Far away... Maron Sokol looks, crayon, snaps in two. Hank swerves too late. His kick snaps the brakes. They tumble past RJ in a clumsy arc and come down hard. Three tires blow simultaneously, hubcaps drawing sparks across the gravel. They screech, they strike a handy fence post and up ends, wavering a moment before flipping over back. The gas tank goes a second later. It's all a bit too quick for any last thoughts. Back at the gas station, an offer exit, officer exiting the restroom exclaims as a red flower blooms against the sky. RJ walks on. She passes the shell of Hank's car, cracks wide, and bleeding, blazing lines of oil across the asphalt. Steps over one and over part another, leaving a sizzling black smear. She doesn't feel the flames. The damage she has done here is nothing to her. She isn't sad or particularly elated. Just full. For a while, at least. She turns her back and leaves it all behind. North. Always north. 
This is her country. Its frozen soil holds her up as winter creeps a little closer with every step she takes. It knows her hunger. It knows her need. Toronto. And Myron. And then? RJ was born at five in the morning, the hour of the ox. When the dead bell rings, her father lives in a house full of carefully preserved lovers. He never answered back, never grew old, just a bit dustier and less elastic. From this house, her mother ran naked to the Winnipeg night into the street to flag down the first truck she met. RJ came half a year later, suited in blood, her mouth full of half and half eaten placenta. Her mother lo- took one look at her and let go. Now she moves a canker on world streams past the houses of the unwary a circle of darkness flows, constant and pure, and pinging briefly on all she touches, leaving scars, erasing flood leaking through the ill-kempt seams of neat yards and tidy gardens, a draining slog of numbness, sleep, and visions which vanish on waking, yet remain. RJ knows her path well, an inner compass keeps her steady, marking her, marking off the miles. She has an appointment to keep. And that is the end. And that wasn't even 30 minutes, that's a pretty good, maybe we'll continue with this book. It's pretty good. Um, it's a collection of short stories. It's called... Um, Kissing Karen, we'll continue it like every third time of the week. I kind of have a schedule in the sense of like um, three times a week, and then the first one's a little more trashy. The third one is the second one is um a book I've read before, and maybe a, probably Chinese novels because I've been reading those. We'll translate it, but and then the third day is always gonna be like an English novel of some sort. That's actually a good book and less trashy. That's probably going to be the title. Less trashy or something. But, um... Yeah, it's called Kissing Caron. Um... Um, the author is called Gemma Files. I'm pretty sure that is not the person's real name. But, yeah. That's a good, interesting author name. It was published in 2015. Let's read the description. I'm really getting a dry throat right now. I'm probably sure you guys could tell. Um, From the haunted hills of Roman Britain to the sewers of occupied occupied Warsaw. In the bloody streets of revolutionary Paris. In the anarchy of World War II. Shanghai. Out of the wilds of America. India. Africa and Europe, down the long, savage darkness of the centuries. Monsters have fed upon us. They are chef- shapeshifters, vampires, sorcerers, and spirits. Things deemed only in myth and things for which we have no name. They are our demons, our reflections, our desires, and our nightmares. And all too often, they are only human in this second collection from gemma files featuring award-winning the emperor's old bones and five never before published stories we tour the overlooked intersection between wildness and civilization where secret dances are feared and pain are performed and hunters and hunted changed roles yeah this is a good one i'm like you like if we want to do a book club right now i was just like this um is realistic like and people who have 
live in these kind of um, lives where they feel stuck in a certain situation or especially between children who are stuck between parents that are negligent like thoughts of and not even that people do have casual thoughts of murder i think someone has if i remember this being said somewhere in um a book um actually yeah it's called the the book is called the fear and this is a non-fiction book um like agency ceo like he's taking care of people before and he said that um well not only statistically are men more aggressive than women but he um he's also saying various other things and telling different stories and that's the first chapter is kind of a horror story in itself it's non-fiction i don't know um and he talks about how like um everything you've ever thought about that is like the most terrible thing that ever can happen like he's like imagine it imagine like the most terrible thing that can happen to you it's and if you can think of it then other people have thought about it before and it's happened before it's a scary thought because what i thought about is scary and i've asked this question to a relative of mine as well and he told me the same thing like that i thought of so it was crazy to me but then it makes you realize that and I think a lot of us don't like to face it as well the darkness that lives within everybody and the casual thoughts of shooting somebody that you love or shooting a family member or are doing very aggressive things to people like and doing very morally unjust things to people like they live in our heads that darkness is in us and I think that is what the story is talking about not only the monsters that maybe have existed before i'm sure this is a like a mythology monster that exists but the mythology monster is just a representation and a reflection of the darkness within humanity right as i'm pretty sure what they're trying to share and yeah and i think that's probably the scariest part is that although these darkness um these darknesses were um being probably um, amplified by her presence rj they the scariest part is that it's possible and that they have thought these things and people do think these things and because of these thoughts families like this do exist that people don't treat each other well that moments of arguments and moments of complete oh, i'm sorry oh my god i need to pause because <laughs> to, there's an announcement out Okay, so I think it mostly passed, but in any case, it's just um, the scariest part is that like tragedies of this like have, have happened. Um, the worst gets the best of us, right? The worst of our thoughts and the worst of ourselves and the fact that you don't even have to be a murderer like RJ's father, okay? That contrast to um, have these thoughts and... Um, tragedies occur in the sense of fits of anger fits of passion that end up in murder right not everyone that is a murderer was a serial killer but um everything that like we that and we don't have to be a murderer in our minds in the sense of like we don't have to be crazy or to be a murderer in our minds that's probably the scariest part right that we live with that as humans that that is a realization of humanity itself. That darkness also lives within us. That we can think so terribly and conversely, maybe be so terrible as well, even if we're not at the same time. Um, so like in like overall. Anyways, yeah, that car, yeah. I hate it when the elections come by and then because they they just like sit in their cars and sit with the microphone and just like keep drive by like I am this vote for me they literally just do that and so annoying everyone's so annoyed <laughs> but I think that was just an announcement around the town about trash <laughs> anyways so I hope that was good um and you enjoyed that and this is the first week of october and the first week of a scary week and 
um i guess i should tell you to follow and uh, share and enjoy this i hope you're you're liking it i know i sing i'm a lot of hopes because i'm hoping very much <laughs> uh what else what else should i say if you have any recommendations share me because i don't really know what to read um if anything i might just continue with this book but i don't know I'm trying to look for something else maybe to read and yeah so i hope you liked it <laughs> keep saying hope oh <laughs> uh, yeah i have a twitter now um just to like update in case i don't update on time like i'm doing right now <laughs> it's um mid underscore nm if you want to follow and although i said i'm gonna do youtube i don't know i'm kind of scared again comments scare me <laughs> oh, i'm scared <laughs> be nice but oh well uh okay so have a good night have a good morning have a good day have a good life and as always, thanks for listening.